Let's pray. Lord, I'm so glad that you gave us a sense of humour. So glad also that we can come together as a part of your family. We can not only worship you, sing songs of praise, have fellowship together, hear testimonies, but we can also feed on your word. We can encourage one another. So I pray today, Lord, that you cause your Holy Spirit to just uh, help us to see the truths of your word that we, and help us to apply it to our life, that we might be changed a little bit more into your image. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In um, the New American Standard Bible, which is a different version, um, some I like it as a, as a version. I find it's a very readable translation. Uh, although today I'm using a New King James Bible, but for this little scripture I'm using the New American Standard. And it says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be, it says, adequate. King James says complete. And what it really means is that we might be suitably, and then it goes on, equipped for every good work. So all scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable to reprove us, to correct us and instruct us in the way that we should live in on this earth. Now, there's a little word in there. That it starts with all scripture and that's exactly what it means, all, not some. There's a tendency, I find, to grab the bits that you like and disregard the bits that you don't like. Or grab the bits that you understand and the ones you don't understand, you just put them on the shelf. But he says that all scripture, even those bits that um, we think are unimportant, they are all profitable in helping, we can use them to help to develop us and, and cause us to grow. And there's an Old, Old Testament book of, there's only actually two chapters that I think is easily dismissed or we would often see it as irrelevant. We think, oh, well, that's just a part of history. And um, I think it's something that we can use. And in its context, the uh, children of God, children of Israel, had, had returned from years of ex exile and they had begun to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And... They'd started out very well. They'd actually built an altar for offering sacrifices to God. And in fact, they'd actually already done that. They'd already offered some sacrifices. They'd laid the foundation of the temple. But then they faced opposition. Opposition came and they actually ceased work on the temple, they became distracted and then they started to just do their own thing. And I guess as we look at them, we see, you can actually see that they had been, they'd become discouraged, they were dissatisfied with their progress and they, and they really lost interest in what they had been called to do. And they became more interested in building their own house. This is something that I find relevant for me because I, I do have interests out there. I mean, I, I enjoy my bowls. I, there's a few things that I enjoy doing. And it is very easy to become distracted. We, it's very hard sometimes to find a balance. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do things that we like to do, but we do need to keep a, a balance. So... Over a period of slightly less than four months, the Lord gave five messages through Haggai, which caused the people to, to rally, and they ended up, they completed the temple within 
within about five years. So if you've got a Bible that's the same as mine, it's on page 1049. Um, if it's not, you're going to have to find it. But it's just before the end of the Old Testament. Um, it's not far through, probably about a dozen pages. If you get to where the New Testament starts and then just flick back about a dozen pages, you'll be pretty close. And uh, so I want to look at these five messages that the prophet Haggai gave to the people from the Lord. And then we want to have a look at um, how we can apply it or if we can apply it to ourselves. So we'll see how we go. First message is actually on the first day of the sixth month in the uh, second year of King Darius's reign. And so we'll read from verse 2 through to verse 9. And it says, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your panelled houses in this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You've sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. So the first message he's really saying here, he's saying, consider your ways. Consider what you've done. And what have they done? Well, they'd, they'd, rede- they'd neglected to build the Lord's house. And really verse 6 speaks to them about their priorities and saying how they've sown a lot and they haven't sort of got anything out of it. It's, it doesn't seem to matter how hard they work, they don't seem to have enough. And he's saying not only consider what you've done, but have a look at your priorities and, and see what you should do, the fact that they should build his house. And in verse 12 we see their response when Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnants of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. So the result was that they actually, they repented, they said, okay, we hear what you're saying, and they got into it, and they started again to build the Lord's house. The second message, so the first message was on the first of the sixth month. The second message came on the 24th day of the sixth month. So three weeks later, in verse 13 through to verse 15, Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. So here we see that the Lord, in the second message, the Lord promised that he would be present with them. He said, I am with you. But he didn't only do that, he he actually stirred up their spirits. Have you ever had something where you felt stirred up inside you? I had an instance one day, probably, I think it was the summer before last, I was actually out on the the bowling green and a guy was using the Lord's name, as they often do, And something rose up inside me and I got absolutely angry with the way he was using the Lord's name. And I went up to him, middle of a bowling green, about 
40 people on the bowling green, and he'd been going, and I went up to him, and I said to him, mate, you want to you curse, don't curse in the name of my Lord. You curse in the name of Buddha or someone else, but Muhammad even, but, but not Jesus. And it just, something, it just, it overwhelmed me. I was so stirred in my spirit. In fact, I sort of halfway through, I'm thinking, Richard, what are you doing? <laughs> and it was like I got, I got taken over. And um, I, th- I think it was God. I hope it was. But it, it wasn't anything that, to me personally, but I was just so aggrieved by what he was doing to my Lord's name. And when we see here that this, the Spirit of the Lord stirred them up, that, that stirring up, it actually means to awaken, to, ri- to excite, to raise up, to arouse, to action, or open one's eyes. And that's exactly what had happened to me. I was aroused into an action. And it's a similar word that's used for any of you who I used to play the trumpet in my younger years, don't have enough breath for it now. Um, Some say I'm full of wind, but I don't think I am. I used to be. Maybe it comes out the wrong end, I don't know. But um, we used to have to warm our instrument up. You'd You'd have to, you know, blow it, because otherwise it never played well. Um, and same with the guitar, those sort of things. You, you really, you, you awaken your instrument to play it. Or you, and that's part of life. It's a similar thing to the, the stirring up. So the Lord promised his presence and stirred his people. The third message is on the 21st day, is a month later in the seventh month. Chapter 2, verse 3 through to 9. Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 5, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you, do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. And the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. In the third message here, he compares the the temple that they're building that needs to be built to the to Solomon's temple. He's comparing the the glory of the former to what is now. And he tells them to be be strong and work. He reminds them that he's with them and that they're not to be afraid. And he says, God will fill his house with his glory. The next message he gives is actually about two months later. It's on the 24th day of the ninth month. This is the fourth message. And we pick it up in um, verse 11 of chapter 2. I'm skipping some of it, but you can read it when you're home. And I hope it might give you a fresh, perhaps, insight as to the relevance of some of these passages. Verse 11, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now asks the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it become holy? And the priest answered and said, no. And Haggai said, if one is unclean because of a dead body that touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, it shall be unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so is this people and so is this nation before me, says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands and what they offer there, is unclean. So the prophet actually comes with a question. 
And the question is about clean and unclean things. So he says, if you have a clean thing and you touch an unclean thing, will the unthing become clean? No. But if you touch an unclean th- a clean thing with an unclean thing, the clean thing will become unclean. So what he's saying is there that their conclusion is that um, uncleanliness is contagious, whereas clean- cleanness is not. So they needed to understand here that if you have something that's clean and you touch it with something that are, that's unclean, it makes it unclean. And he goes on to say in verse 18, Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the Lord's day, that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid Consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have yet not yielded fruit. But from this day forward I will bless you. And it appears that the the message, what he's saying here is whilst clean things are made unclean by touching unclean things what he's saying is whilst that's contagious things don't become clean that way but what he's saying here is they need to understand that really they can't earn the blessings of God it's something that is it's a it's a result of God's grace and so they're blessed because God chooses to bless them it's not something that just happens or is a consequence necessarily from their work. It's an act of grace. God promised, I will bless you. And his last message, which is on the same day in verse 21, says, speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, saying, I will shake. And it's interesting to look at how many, these are things that God says, I will do. Their declarations, he says, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and I will make you as a signet ring, for I have chosen you says the Lord of hosts. So there are six distinct promises there and what they really say is that he will fight for them. God will do this stuff for them. And so even though this is an Old Testament passage, I believe there's a message for us today. I think we can learn something from it and we can apply these truths to our life and they'll help us. And I think if we become discouraged, and there's times when we do, if we become dissatisfied with with where we're at, and I'd have to admit I've, I've been in that place and from time to time I get in that place where I'm not quite satisfied with where I am or with the way things are going, we may lose interest in the task that's at hand if we get distracted, I think there's something here that we can we can learn. And so I guess this is really the key of what I want to say too. We too, I think, should consider our ways. What am I doing with my life? What am I what am I doing with what God's gifted me with? What am I doing with my my talents? You might sit there and say, Well, I don't really have any talents, but We all have something, even if we only have one talent, we all have something. So the question is, what what am I doing with what God has given me? What are my priorities? What am I doing? Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It doesn't say seek our righteousness, it says seek his 
and by joining our, when we become grafted to that tree of life, that's when we start to draw on that life. That's what makes us clean. And he goes on and he says, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. And, and I think we do live in a world today where people are always worrying about the future. A lot of emphasis on it. If you don't put money in your super, you're not going to have money. You're not going to be able to get a pension. You're not going to be able to live. All the stuff you're not going to be able to do. But I'm not saying don't plan for your future. But remember that you live now. There's no point in storing it all up for the future if you don't live now. Jesus came that you might have life, life in all its fullness. I might have shared, we, the other day I was actually bowling with a guy and he started praying. Oh, Jesus. And I said to him, mate, you, you pray more than I do. And he said, oh, he said, I... I said, you talk to him more than I do. Oh, he said, I don't know him. And I said, well, what are you using his name for? And so we, we started having a little chat and about where I stand with the Lord and where he stood and then the coach got involved and he's an atheist and he doesn't believe in God. So my question is always when they say don't believe in God, I say, well, what sort of God don't you believe in? Because I probably wouldn't believe in a God like that either. Um, and so it, it ended up quite a good discussion. But afterwards, it was interesting. I bought, he never swore again after that. <laughs> I don't know whether that's having an influence where... But I, like to, I try to challenge I, their, their thought pattern because I, I don't think I'm there just by chance. My excuse for bowling is, well, that's what God's... He's put me there. See how we can justify stuff if we want to. But I do attempt to be sensitive to what he wants me to share, that I might be an impact. I don't want to just bowl just for the sake of me bowling as much as I enjoy it, but I want it to contribute in some way to, to building his kingdom or at least having an impact in the sphere of influence that it's placed me in. So we should consider our ways. Every one of us, I believe, has a part to play in building God's house. We're all part of his church. We're all parts of his body. Just as all the parts of our physical body are needed, we can manage without them. You can chop someone's leg off. We can still get by. I've had my appendix out. I can still get by without that. Had half my thyroid out, still get by without that. There's a few things we can get by without, but it doesn't alter the fact that those bits are missing. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through to 14 says, As the body is one and has many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we're all baptised into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body's not one member, but many. We're not independent beings. Whilst we, in a lot of ways, we, we act and operate independently, we really are interdependent. We need each other. Now, sometimes we don't think we do, but the fact is, we do. We need each other. The Bible speaks about iron sharpening iron. I need you. You help to encourage me in my walk in God. And you need me. I won't intentionally do anything to hurt you, but I probably will do something that will cause you to be upset at some time. But... I can assure you it won't be intentionally. I won't do it intentionally. We won't labour on that. We'll move on. 
consider our ways. Every one of us has a part to play. Thirdly, God has promised his presence. As he promised it to those people way back then, he promises it to you and I. In verse 13, chapter 13, verse 5 of Hebrews, he says, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. When you feel like the heavens are closing in you, when you think your whole world is falling apart, when you think there is no hope and you don't know where to turn, all you need to do is close your eyes and visualise the Lord and remember he is there with you. There is nothing that you will go through on this earth that he hasn't been there with you. He'll always be with you. It doesn't matter how big a mess you make of your life. He's there for you to call on. He's an ever-present help in times of trouble. Fourthly, as he stirred their spirits, he wants us to be filled with his spirit. In fact, we're told in Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. He wants us to be absolutely filled and we have to keep on being filled. You see, my problem is I leak and uh, I leak the spirit and so I have to keep being filled. But I've got news for you. We all leak a bit. We evaporate something, but it all dissipates. So we have to keep on being filled. Don't get drunk with wine. I enjoy the occasional beer on a hot day. Um, I was actually, actually it's Steve's fault, because <laughs> it is. I was actually teetotal for 18 years. And I went to a thing and Steve had a beer and he was the pastor. <laughs> and I thought, oh. light. yeah, a light. Yeah, I, so I had a light too and I, I enjoyed it. I'll always stop. I, I have a self-imposed limit. I'll never have more than two light beers and that's only stubby, it's 3.30, so I'll never have any more than 700 mil, and I won't drive if I've had anything to drink, So because I believe in zero alcohol. They're the things I've said on myself, and um, though having said that, I did once about 10 years ago, because I had a beer about 4 o'clock, and then I went down, and Marion said, do you want to have Indian for tea? So I went down and bought it and then got home and I realised I'd had a beer in the afternoon. I'd forgotten I'd had it. But So I won't intentionally drive after I've been drinking. That's my rules. Okay. We need to be strong. That's my fifth point. We shouldn't let difficulties, enemies or selfish pursuits distract us from our God-given responsibilities. James 1 says, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Why? Well, we know that when we go through these trials, God is testing our patience. Now, remember, he's not testing your character, he's testing your faith. It's a test of our faith that's going on here. So often we see it as a test of our character and that I'm failing to stand as the person that I am. But really, it's always a test of our faith. Our faith is all, and what did he say? When I come back, will I find faith? Will I find people who are being faithful to me? We hear people talk about, you know, a great falling away and how there's only going to be a faithful remnant. I don't know whether that's true or not, but if it is, I want to be one of those that's faithful to the end. I want to stand before the Lord and have him say, well, Richard, you didn't do too bad a job. And if he'll say that, I'll be pretty happy I reckon okay we need to be strong six point we can it's amazing you know there are only five messages but I got eight points out of it so anyway we can trust God to provide he will provide our needs when we do his work he might not provide the needs for our greeds but he will provide the needs for his work. 
Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory, not according to our own riches. And I've been in instances I can testify before I knew the Lord where I'd absolutely come to the end of my own resources. I didn't have enough to money to make the payments for my car, so I took my car back to the, the dealer where I'd bought it. And I bought an old bomb from the wreckers and um, six months later I get a letter from the finance company to tell me how good a credit rating I've got because I paid the loan out before it was due. Um, I didn't pay it out at all. The car yard did when they wanted to resell the vehicle. I always thought that was weird, but I know what it's like to be hard up. I, for, for two years when I worked when I worked back at night, I used to... I'd always know the day before and I'd have to take sandwiches and I'd nearly, I'd nearly vomit when I had a sandwich because I never had any money. So we had, we had tight. In fact, we got that desperate. We actually, I put a petition in our garage and I, I rented our garage out. And we had an old, old lady come and stayed in it for a while and that actually helped us through financially. I know what it's like to be tight. That was before I knew the Lord. The crazy thing was, when I came to the Lord, I got saved and then I understood the principle of, of tithing, giving a tenth of my income. And I've heard people say, should you tithe on the gross or should you tithe on the net? Um, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but do you want a net blessing or do you want a gross blessing? That's the way I look at it. But So I tithed on what I was earning and you know we never ever went hungry we never seemed to have more than we needed but we always seemed to have enough to meet our needs and that's really all that the Lord has promised and so my testimony is, is all through my Christian life and I got saved when I was just turned 30 and I'm nearly 72 now so it's, you can do the sums and um, I've operated that principle in my life and God has never failed me. Sure, we've had to juggle things a little bit sometimes. We've had to forego some of our greeds a little bit sometimes. But we've always been able to manage and I'm still here today. My God will supply all your needs. He might not supply all your greeds, but he will your needs. Seventh point I've got here is comparing past achievements may discourage us. Who's ever failed in their life, failed to do something? Who's fallen short? Been there, done that? The good thing is we don't live back there, we live today. And what's gone is gone. We can learn from it, but we don't live in it. We may suffer some of the consequences of it because there are always consequences of our actions but the fact is that we don't live in the past, we live now and it's no good as I said before, we can worry so much about what I'm going to do but if we're trusting God, he will guide us he will lead us in it we don't live in the past, we live now Romans 8 is an interesting thing and Phil and I were talking about it in the break and Romans 8 1 says there's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but walk in the spirit and we forget the context of it and the context of Romans 8 particularly verse 1 is that it's in, it comes after Romans 7 now that's very profound because some of us will focus on aspects of Romans 7 and Paul said the things that I want to do I don't do and the things that I, you know, I want to do I don't do the things that I do I don't want to do and oh wretched man that I am and we can all identify with that the trouble is Paul saying that's what he was like before he got saved and he said, who'll deliver me from this wretched body? And then he said, praise be to God, through Jesus Christ. Now, therefore, there's no condemnation. 
And so we think, oh, yeah, well, I fall short. Yeah, well, Paul did too. Well, he did before he got saved. And we need to remember that we are now new creatures in Christ. And we ought not to be in a place where we're doing the things we don't want to do and not doing the things that we do want to do. That's Old Testament. That's law. Now, by the grace of Jesus Christ, we can do all things through him. And now there is no condemnation. So we move from there. And it's learning how to live in the reality of what we are in Christ. My last point is God empowers those who serve him. It's God that enables us to fulfil our commission. We all remember that Matthew 28, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that he's taught them. And he says, Lo, I'm with you even to the end. That's a commission not just for the pastor. That's all of us. We all, we all should be discipling someone. Now that's a challenge and it's very easy to say, well, I want someone to disciple me. But in, the, in being, and we all need someone to disciple us too, but in that we should also be discipling someone else. So look for someone that you can encourage in the war. And I can tell you this, if you're feeling a bit down, a bit depressed in life and everything else, go and share your faith with someone. And you won't be depressed for long. It's amazing. And I can speak from personal truth in that. So, just to finish, I did pretty well. 12 o'clock is always my aim. It doesn't matter what time I start, I always finish at 12. God calls us to commit who we are, what we have and what we do to him. So three things. Who we are, commit it to him. I am a child of his. I love, I love that song. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. You know, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now a saint. How good is that? Romans 15 is a really good benediction because it's like a prayer. And he says in Romans 15, 5, Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Jesus Christ, that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.